hi, hello, 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 hello. Uh, my name is Aidan. I'm going to be talking about capitalism. I'm very sorry that my camera seems to be a little bit blurry, uh, but we'll power on and hopefully I'll say such interesting things that you won't mind. Um, just to double check that that is actually working. This is meant to be a comment. Sorry. Fab. So we're all good. What I'm going to do. I'm going to break this into two parts. The first is I'm going to discuss general groundings um, and approaches from which you might try to defend. I'm going to walk through more pragmatic questions uh, and ways in which capitalism might be helpful to solving some of the problems that tend to face the world in general uh, and you in debates. Before I do kind of debating things, obviously closure about it not being my opinion. Uh, but more than that, I think actually in capitalism versus communism style economic debates more than many others, uh, it's important to bear in mind that the answer is nearly almost somewhere in the middle. Um, for various reasons that I hope to make clear, uh, oftentimes over-regulating markets is inefficient. Um, and leads to some harms. Alternatively, I think at lots of times you can point out that there are large issues in allowing slightly too much freedom. So the hope that I'm trying to give is not that you would take everything uh, in this workshop and try to run that as the libertarian utopia that it would be, but more so that some of the aspects will come in helpful in drawing particular lines in debates uh, in trying to identify why one motion either doesn't go quite far enough or goes too far uh, towards a socialist or commun or uh, capitalist outcome. The other thing that I just want to say at the outset, because I think it's quite interesting about these debates, uh, is that people, when they're forced to defend capitalism, seem to lack an awful lot of imagination. Uh, and I think that this is a concern, uh, because in debate, you really want to answer on the grounds that an argument is made. Uh, you definitely don't want to be the one kid in the corner uh, yelling, what about principles? But on the other hand, I think it's a little bit disappointing when you get into debates and there's an awful lot from the communists uh, about how we have nothing to lose but our shackles. Uh, and then people on the other side debate are like, oh, very, very efficient, to be honest. Uh, so I think that a, a both an ability to engage on the real substantial level uh, that people try to take debates on the other side is important. Um, and also, I think a real awareness as to who you're able to look out for and being the good guys from a more capitalist standpoint in an awful lot of debates is very helpful. So with that in mind, I'll start my four kind of uh, groundings, as it were. So the first is largely about accountability. The reason I say this is because I, I think that this starts from a standpoint that most people can get behind whatever kind of ideology uh, they feel like they're defending. It's quite middle ground to say that democracies should be transparent, that they should allow people to hold their government in check, uh, and that there should be some, I suppose, element of give and take that when governments are taking an awful lot, we can watch what they're doing. We have checks on those, pal those powers um, and we don't just let them do what they want. I think in that context, right-wing arguments have an awful lot to argue uh, about the extent to which, um, sorry, I should say it's just popping up here. If you have any questions at all, uh, do pop it in there. But I mean, I doubt many of those will pop up. But if you do have anything at all, do fire it in and we'll have a good chat about that. But yeah, so I think there's an awful lot to be said about the extent to which general government operations uh, are incredibly difficult to account for or to say that people have much control over. Um, and that isn't in itself to try to rubbish all social contract arguments um, or any kind of consent into society arguments, because I think there's actually ways that they can be made quite interestingly in uh, in debates. More so, I think the line that, that interests me um, most or that I've seen come out most in debates about capitalism is the extent to which democracy asks people to rank their choices and to make quite a, a broad or a blunt decision uh, which sums up all of what they would like for the next four years, right? So yeah, enter a democratic booth and you're going to pick one politician. And I think very few people would have the luxury of basing that decision then on specific financial decisions made not actually by that politician but more so by the civil service. And that, I think, is something you can paint quite effectively in debates uh, as a real issue when it is your money they're talking about. Um, and the real problem I think a lot of people run into in, in uh, debates about this are the kind of examples that they choose to pick. Um, I mean, really, I think 
what you want to look at are, are things like people of color uh, in America having to pay to fund a police force that many would say is uh, unfair or certainly they might feel uh, is targeting them with often very brutal violence. Uh, LGBTQ plus individuals having to fund uh, electroshock therapy uh, in whatever given state uh, it is something that I think most people intuitively feel uh, is a bad system that you should be bound into. And the argument then that flows out of that obviously is that people should have the opportunity and the chance themselves to make the decisions that they want to with their money and that there's something broken about the system um, which is necessarily all left-wing systems that presumes to make those decisions with people's money without asking them. I think what that piles into uh, is really that a lot of people are very willing to buy into uh, very liberal or libertarian social arguments about leaving people alone to make their own decisions. So for example, if people want to decide what schools they should want to fund and want to send their kids to, uh, then that should be uh, their prerogative, especially in their private life. But that doesn't fit into a, a social system where we allow the government the amount of control and economic power over their lives um, that will impact that. So the, the big example I suppose you want to come to there uh, is to look at school systems where either you may have to send your kid to a place that is saying things that are actively offensive or hurtful derogatory to that person, which we could all fill in uh, examples there, or even on a more practical basis, that you would have to fund schools that you don't think are doing the best job for you uh, and you're not able to uh, physically, because you're in whatever district, escape that market and that broken system to get in somewhere else. So the outcome of that really is that while many of us would think that people can do whatever they want in their private lives, uh, those private lives are controlled to a large extent by economic laws uh, and economic powers around them, which are going to bind uh, and control them a lot more than democratic uh, or negative laws usually would. Um, so in terms of that, if you buy into systems of general freedom, so, and by that I mean, you know, allowing people to do what they want in their, their own private lives, their own sexual lives, their own religious lives, um, it makes sense that when a lot of our decisions in all aspects are controlled by money, there should be some private element of control to that. Um, the final thing uh, just to put in there is in terms of uh, limiting uh, states' powers is that obviously when you set up some sort of economic system that gives people freedom or that lets them control their lives, they have far more of an ability um, to actualize that uh, in a political sense. And so I think you want to compare those two. Uh, the best example that I could come up with when I was thinking about this was prisons. Uh, so there is a large part of what you might have to defend in privatizing most aspects are that you are going to try to defend, uh, for example, privatizing prison systems. And there's lots of intuitive arguments that go against that, and lots of very mainstream arguments about how much that traps people in systems and it doesn't do enough to try to get them in out because there is now a profit incentive to keep them there as long as possible. I think that what I that the the helpful thing to do in that stance, uh, and sorry, I, I should have made this more clear, is in terms of weighing up those different forms of right wing ideals or more capitalist ideals, uh, in saying that if you buy most social uh, liberalism or libertarianism or even trends towards that, then a lot of that can correct for the economic wrongs that you might feel come out of it. So for example, a prison system that incarcerates far too many people might have less to do with the profit incentive of people who own that prison to keep people in there, and it might have more to do overly uh, restrictive laws, which uh, are particularly punitive on, be it uh, drugs or be it um, petty crimes, uh, which more liberal tending people might feel shouldn't be a crime in the first place. Um, and so if you can pinpoint your uh, your harms toward there a little bit, then it might give you more of a grounding in terms of defending where right wing isms come from, as it makes sense. So that first stance that you want to take uh, is just to recognize the amount of uh, ideas that are actually quite mainstream, quite normalized uh, amongst judges in your audience. Uh, and so utilize that as one grounding for where uh, where your right wing arguments come from. And those ultimately being 
a mixture of accountability, they should know um, that their government is held in check to a large extent, and secondly then, that people should have as much control over their individual lives as physically possible, and that economic, a lack of economic control has quite a devastating impact towards that. There's two more arguments that I want to go over here, um, and I honestly think that these are less applicable in as wide a spectrum of debates, but become more important in very few of them. These are more so, I suppose, the underpinnings that you want to think about when you're developing capitalist or, or right-wing kind of arguments in a BP-style debate. Um, they are less often what you want to come up with or responsiveness. Uh, in terms of it. But the, the first is to try to pin, I suppose, something really wrong or something problematic about taking people's uh, money or the, uh, the creation, of the things that they create in wealth away from them. Um, you'll hear a lot of people uh, going on about tax as something that is unfair or something that most governments shouldn't do. And I think what that comes down to really uh, is that in a debate, you need to be able to connect tax um, or you need to be able to create the labor that people uh, undertake to create a good to the product of that labor uh, and as such the wealth that they end up with, right? So I work all day in a field, uh, I have some lovely crops, I then sell those crops and I have my money at the end. Um, and the problem, I suppose, with more left-wing approaches is that it will require taking that money in order to further uh, other social outcomes. Now, I think that this is in many instances a, a, a tough sell to come across with. Uh, so I think what you need to do with it is that you need to very clearly point out the elements of just how egregious it is to take people's time, their labor, or the product of that time. Um, and so essentially, when I say that you want to equate the two in terms of what people have created and their actual labor itself, it, it's helpful that there's an intuitive connection often that when we think of servitude or forced labor, a key component of that is, of course, that people won't be able to keep what is theirs at the end or the product of their good. Uh, and the underpinning that people try to give to that um, from a, a more right-wing ilk uh, is, of course, that in mixing your labor uh, with raw materials and with the um, the machinery needed for that, the, that the owners of capital have, you have given something a particular value, uh, imbued that with your labor. Um, and so in the same way as you own your labor, you now own that good to an extent. Um, and I think that this debate, obviously from the conversation is, it's, it's in a, a very niche minority of debates that you get into any of this kind of detail, but it's important for you to understand um, purely because it gives that principle underpinning of why we think it is so important that people have any economic freedom uh, and any right to their goods at all. That, that will be used in a much more uh, reasonable or more kind of moderate way in an awful lot of debates. So essentially what you want to say is that after mixing your wealth uh, with something, that's what really gives it its value. And that's helpful because an awful lot of left-wing thought comes from the exact same approach. But the conclusion that you might reach on the more right-wing style is that people then should at the very least have a right to control those goods um, uh, or the product of their labor. Um, and it, we should have at least very good reason for taking it off them. So the context that you want to put that in is questioning how effective and how efficient systems um, of welfare or the questions in that regard are and whether they're getting bang for their book when you're taking so much off. Often, I mean, reasonably vulnerable people still pay a large proportion of their wages. So 20% of your wages means an awful lot less to somebody who is working with an awful lot less money. And there is a large question about whether it's justified for us to take that money off them. The final thing that I mentioned, and I mentioned it uh, last out of all of these groundings, because I really do think um, that out of all of them, while it's quite interesting uh, from a philosophical perspective, it's not going to come in quite so much uh, to, to a, an awful lot of mainstream debate that I hope to be tackling a lot more with more practical questions later on. Uh, but I do think it's important for people to be uh, to conceptualize how much a, a more materialistic approach and a more capital uh, capitalist driven or more specifically uh, a private property uh, respecting community is important to an awful lot of human growth. So I think that this is too glibly or too quickly uh, just pure selfishness or luxury goods. If you think about what it means to own a product, really what it means is that you can have a long lasting and certain change on that good. So you are able to control the way that it will be treated in future, that aspect of the world when I say that good. And that's really very important to the way that we conceptualize ourselves 
the value that we impose for ourselves and the hopes that we try to build uh, in the world around us. So to take a very basic example, I think most people would feel an awful lot less comfortable if they couldn't close their front door behind them uh, to have a, a level of privacy uh, and uh, I suppose a, a secluded place that was their own that they could become themselves, they could relax and retreat from the outside world. And that's similar when you look at aspirations for the future. So what you want to leave your child, the inheritance that you want to build up yourself, um, the world that you want to leave for the people that come after you. I think it's quite natural for humans to struggle towards that an awful lot and to hope to change things beyond themselves. And private property, in a large extent, is the only way that you're able to do that and to have a permanence on the world because you need to be able to control something um, and to look after it uh, in order for you to know that it will stay in the manner that you hope it would. So I say that and I, I take some time to explain it, despite knowing that this isn't going to come into so many of the debates uh, that you're, I mean, it, likely this is a couple of wacky out rounds more than anything else, but it really is, I think, a, a concern to me that people stretch immediately for pragmatic benefits only on the right without looking for why there might be a more individualistic um, I, I suppose just a uh, moral claim to private property and those foundations of what people on the right would care about. But the two original points that I make about accountability um, and having a limit on state powers and providing alternatives are certainly two, I think, groundings to capitalism and to free markets that, uh, that should be a little bit more appealing to looking after different stakeholders and looking after people who particularly need your help in a debate. So the real question though, uh, I suppose, when it comes to capitalism debates is defending more of the middle ground. So these are more of your questions about privatizing X or Y thing or trusting market structures as opposed in these instances. Um, and I, as I say, I, I hope that a, a couple of these could be helpful in debates, points where teams go to too far or don't go far to a uh, liberal utopia straight off the bat. Um, but there is, I think, a lot to be said for a at least controlled market, uh, if not a full out market by itself. Um, so in terms of context for that, I mean, 700 million people uh, in the 21st century have been taken out of poverty in terms of uh, loosening market restrictions around it. There is, of course, the 680 million people between 1981 and 2010 in China who were dragged out of poverty. So that's just before Xi Jinping. Um, so a couple of reasons that you can certainly at least claim in debates are helpful towards that. So there are five pitfalls, particularly within um, state structures that public markets allow you to escape. So the first is that people oftentimes aren't so careful with goods that aren't their own. And I suppose a better way of putting that might be that capitalism manages to align the less pleasant aspects of humanity and incentives that people have with the more pleasant incentives that those people have. Uh, Milton Friedman is famous for claiming that there's uh, different ways that you consider goods. So when you're buying something for yourself, when you're buying something for somebody else and you care about different things, um, so he claims that there are four ways that you're able to spend money um, in terms of you're buying something for yourself, you care about the amount you're spending and the quality of good that you have. And it goes through that comparing it to if you're buying something for somebody else, like a birthday present, you may care an awful lot still about the cost that you're spending, but you're likely to care slightly less about um, the, the, um, uh, the quality of the good. And if you spend somebody else's money on somebody else, um, then that's essentially what governments do an awful lot of the time and account for 40% of national income. And the problem with that, um, as far as individuals on the right are concerned, is that there is no incentive for you to care about the quality or the amount that you're spending. Um, and I think that this is well illustrated when it comes to things like uh, corporate social responsibility, that there is no need in debates to claim that this is uh, evil of corporations or not altruistic of them. But I think it's very telling that you're able to align within capitalist systems, um, both an incentive to do good and also the um, a, a monetary incentive to do good, sorry, and also an actual a, a human altruistic incentive to do good. Um, and so corporate social responsibility may be one example of that, that it, of course, appeals to markets when you're able to point out to a very moral consumer group that you share some of their morals and that you're willing to buy into that. So that's like airlines refusing to send people currently uh, to allow uh, families that are broken up 
uh, by American immigration onto their flights to be used to send home uh, is a good example of where those corporate uh, incentives align with very moral incentives. Um, but equally, I think the claim from the right is that capitalism very effectively uh, incentivizes you to do what is liked by the majority because they will give you a direct reward for that and they will look after your profits uh, after you in that manner and that you can make as much money as you can out of it. So that's one helpful thing that it aligns. The second thing that I th think is quieting a budget and this is a direct comparison to state alternatives. There is a large issue, I think, um, or it, there's a large issue in terms of states uh, having a yearly budget and there is being no incentive for you as a, a group in that state to come in under budget. So, of course, if you own your own corporation, you want to make as much money as possible. And as a result of that, what you're willing to do is to spend as little money as possible to still get the best outcome and do it as efficiently as you can. If you're in that public service doing the same thing, then even if you are have the best will in the world and you're trying to do your very best, the only thing that happens out of you spending less money than was allocated is that next year they're likely to be given less money when they may in fact need that. And so there's a really perverse incentive in most state structures uh, for people not to try to come under, above, under budget, to go above and beyond expectations and to try to do less. And I think that's helpful in a lot of debates because of course you can try to mimic um, with state control an awful lot the effects of a market you can tell people look this is the amount you have to do it this is your budget but there is certainly a push to go above and beyond in capitalist structures that is altogether missing when you then come to state alternatives uh, one example of the by right-wing leaning individuals is dentistry as a comparison to looking at healthcare costs um, in places like the UK where they have those uh, where the HSE is more likely to cover other health costs than dentistry and you see those costs st stagnating or increasing over time whereas you see dentistry costs actually comparatively falling because there is an, an amount of competition there to work between in that these simply won't exist if it doesn't come in under budget. The third thing that I think you should discuss in these instances uh, is that of political concerns. So there is a perverse incentive from uh, when it comes to politics to obviously look after yourself and to look after the specific constituents that put you in. This is uh, quite basic but sometimes overlooked in debates. So you have those examples of a naval ship being based, being built in the US and each constituent part being put, uh, being put together in different um, in different districts within a state. You have businesses being propped up often, uh, like insurance businesses in Australia, when it might not be the most efficient thing uh, to do that because there are interest in lobby groups uh, to that extent, or because it is politically expedient for particular individuals. I would encourage anybody going to Euros to take that um, in as many contexts as possible. Uh, so to look through um, whether that's in developing nations when there are less checks and balances and people are uh, might have a, a more direct incentives um, to to uh, to misspend money or, or in any institution where people need to look after their own position. I think there really is uh, a problem there that what they're looking at is not the long term large market effects of what happens rather they're looking at how they personally should look most uh, uh well i suppose popular is what it comes down to and so decisions are often made that don't really align people's interests one point that i i would say in this is that china is often used as an example of where um liberalizing markets has led to, to huge benefits but in an awful lot of countries particularly around Europe this is a similar story so certainly in Ireland if you look in the 1950s um, and you look at huge uh, uh, reductions in tax uh, in terms of uh, what's charged of corporations and a direct policy there then that uh, that led to certainly an awful lot of industry being uh, built in Ireland an awful lot of move forward that, in, in that regard now, of course, this is a, a complicated area um, and you wouldn't want to um, presume any one particular stance for countries uh, to take or what does or doesn't work is, uh, is for people who do far more study um, in areas like economics than, than the zero amount of study in economics that I do. Um, but it is, I think, something worth pointing out uh, that often market structures are far more aligned with a long-term public interest than, than the narrow political incentives to appeal to a narrow amount of those voters on the issues that the voters will actually 
vote on or can afford to vote on when it comes to deciding that government again. And for that reason, although politics sounds a lot more like let people decide how they want to spend their money, I think I think it is a lot less transparent and we come back to the grounding that we had at the start uh, about civil services dispelling money and choosing how to spend your money uh, in a way that really isn't uh, very helpful to certainly those most in need um, and those uh, who are relying on the state most. So the next aspect that I talk about, the fourth aspect, is that there's a real absence of lived experience. Um, and this is something I think should come up in an awful lot of any time you find yourself in a right wing uh side of a debate um both in terms of legalizing um any kind of business that currently isn't legalized so letting people contract into something that at first glance looks a little bit mad which is a, a kind of a pattern debate that is set an awful lot um that individuals in those positions are in those positions are usually best placed to know what's best for themselves and how their lives will actually work out. Um, so I suppose the, the point of that is that when people say there is economic duress or economic pressure for you to take a particular uh, course of action, then that may well be a very reasonable position, but it's certainly challengeable in debates to point out that what that really amounts to uh, when you say economic duress is that your world would be even worse than taking this job. Uh, if you weren't allowed to do it. Uh, and that being the case, it seems irrational and arbitrarily cruel, really, uh, to simply stand on a principle and say, no, 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 whatever industry, be it uh, sex work, is something that we don't stand over and is unfair to force anybody into. Um, of course, when you're in that position and know your own life and what weighs up best to yourself, you are best able to decide how to go there. Um, but I, I'd hope a lot of you would uh, be using those arguments anyway. They, I suppose the thing I'd add in that is a discussion uh, that I found helpful an awful lot about minimum wage and the principles then that I took from that and put into an awful lot of other debates. Um, so minimum wage debates, I think sometimes, according to the right anyway, overlook the lived experience of people involved in there. So I suppose the point is, uh, and the way that it would be described by people like Milton Friedman, uh, is that it's essentially saying that if a corporation values you at less than whatever you set the minimum wage at, then you don't deserve a job at all. Uh, and that is, I think, a far harsher and less acceptable way to frame those kind of more left wing alterations and permutations on a market than um, than the uh, than than, uh, than they would like it to be. Put. And when you're able to frame something in that manner, I think it is easier for you to point out that the lived experience of many people involved in these is actually far more complex. It doesn't work out in the way the good intentions uh, of politicians would intend it to. The next thing that I'd mention is that uh, market forces, um, and I think you can often take quite a, a blunt pragmatic offense of this, in a, in a far less pleasant way uh, to how the left would paint it, uh, but possibly more effective manner, are a real check on things like racism, sexism, or any irrational kind of bigotries that exist um, in the, in, on the left and what they're, um, sorry, just one second, uh, and what they're trying to create. So the reason for this is partially the level of greed, that obviously when you can step past racism, sexism, et cetera, you can make yourself more money. But it's more so that when you have the right amount of competition in a market, if you don't do that, other people will undercut you. So Thatcher uh, was, of course, famous um, for lots of bad things, uh, most would say, but also for being very against racism and sexism because of how damned inefficient they are, which is uh, not really what most people would reach for in terms of trying to look after that, um, but certainly a, uh, a better alternative than allowing those uh, to be perpetuated. So I suppose the framing that really this kind of argument needs to take uh, is the reality in an awful lot of worlds that the place that people try to, uh, or, or the real priorities that most governments have in the world are not as altruistic as we might hope um, and are less likely to achieve excellent ends than we would want. And this could even be said, I think, in interestingly in unionist debates. So if you look way back to kind of the um, early unions uh, in America and Teamsters and the amount of racism there towards new workers coming in um, to America and how much they were systematically excluded both from unions and from jobs as a result of it. I think it is worth pointing out in an awful lot of debates that um, that often when we don't, when we're not bound by just what a, a business going out of uh, out of work or out of money if they can't afford to, we in fact end up with a far more 
uh, or a far less philanthropic or far less helpful um, kind of uh, kind of world. The final thing, obviously, with that is that they all of these five reasons tie together to painting a at least a reasonable claim that far more goods are able to be created and far more is made in the world when you are able to have a more right wing approach. Now, this should bring us back to the context I said at the very start, uh, and that is that in most debates, you want to strike a balance. You want to say that the allowing of some liberalization of markets and some of the efficiencies that we can talk about for those five reasons um, are worth uh, uh, give a um, a surplus of wealth that can then be redistributed by some imp impositions on that market and some way that we can kind of redistribute it because there is more to go around. Even if you don't believe in and of itself of the trickle down, that wealth will by itself accumulate uh, in the hands of the many rather than the few, there's certainly now more opportunity for a government to do that. And that's, I, I think, uh, another stance that an awful lot of people take in debates that even those who try to defend kind of a, a full communist takeover now and say, no, this is far more credible now than in any of the past historical uh, examples can only really do that because of the position that capitalism has put society in right now, the wealth that has already been created. You then have a decision of how you would like to uh, pool that wealth and how you would like to distribute it. So that um, that is one way to certainly use capitalism to your advantage. But let's for a moment say that we're not going down uh, that rabbit hole. We're not ready to chicken out yet. We're still sticking with our capitalist values. Um, there is, of course, a, a, an issue with capitalism that wealth doesn't go to those who would need it most, that there's somebody who's going to be left out. Um, now, the first, I suppose we should, I should take a step back and give this context of if you're trying to defend markets in general as an idea, usually the, the very basic explanation that was given to me anyway, uh, is that what capitalism does is it guarantees that those who want something most um, and who indeed need the most um, are able to get that because they're able to speak with their wealth and prioritize in the way that they would like to put their wealth together and so they can get it. Now, I think most people's immediate concern when they hear that is to say um, that this seems to forget that some people have quite a lot more bidding power at start and quite a lot more money. But there are at least two reasons um, that I think capitalism may be able to um, solve for this, or at least you can claim in debates uh, these two grounds. The first is that there is likely to be a blind democratization that you don't see in other goods. Now, this argument finds its root in what we already discussed at the very end of the last segment. Um, so that is, of course, that there is an incentive to bypass any of your personal bigotries that may exist in many societies because you need to to uh, stay afloat as a business and also to make as much profit as you can. There's bad incentives that we have uh, in people align with the good altruistic incentives in capitalism in a happy marriage. Um, but more than that, I think there's a point that needs to be made about the, the way the consumer surplus has tried to be used up over an amount of time. So technology markets uh, and medicine markets work well as this example, uh, I think in some instances at least. So the issue um, that people have, of course, is that when I had my whole rant there, I had my five good reasons in it, and we're making loads more goods, and that's lovely. Those goods are obviously li more likely to go to more wealthy individuals. Now, the reason why that's not likely to be true long term is that while people with less means might be only willing to pay half the amount of it, uh, there's still a hell of a lot more of them. And not collecting that wealth means that there's an awful lot of money left untapped in the world that anyone could just pick up if they could make those goods a little bit cheaper. And for that reason, there's a large incentive to try to do that. I think that it's very easy, at least, to sell in debates that markets uh, naturally divide themselves in this way um, when they keep introducing newer and newer goods, so particularly a technology, right? Uh, every couple of years, they're getting half the size or uh, double the speed or half the price. Um, and the reason that half the price comes in there, you can argue, is that when you constantly have more goods being created, there is always a new modern, a novelty good that can, you can charge the premium on and make your absolute bomb out of charging to the most wealthy. But there is then an opportunity as time goes on when there's now a, a, net, a natural segregation in your goods that you're creating between what's newer and older, that you can sell those older goods um, to other individuals to make a hell of a lot more money out of it. And I think that that is helpful in debates to point out how those goods do eventually trickle down to other individuals and are likely to go to get more profit. The other thing that I think you really have to hammer home here uh, is the way in which untapped markets 
um, are able to, uh, to uh, operate more fairly than democratic decision making. So I think it's a, a fallacious claim. That's not a word, is it? Facetious. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a facetious claim to say that uh, the markets are going to be uh, absolutely fair. I think it is a fair point to point out that people can use um, their money to some extent to prioritize uh, what they want, and they certainly can have a voice in the market. Um, and this is worth looking at. So people who have less cash can uh, can obviously spend an awful lot less, but they still have a uh, they are still a market to be that money can be made out of, and they're still a valuable group. And what that means is that individuals who would have been entirely overlooked by communities often aren't. Um, now, one example which uh, doesn't fit quite in that extreme kind of argumentation that I, I'm pointing out there, but I think is certainly come up in an awful lot of debates, uh, is looking at sanitary products being developed um, and the amount that quite misogynistic states have been lagging far behind it. So there still hasn't been a long-term study uh, on the effect of tampons by any state ever. Um, there have by corporations who've had to sell them. That is a market that's had to be set up and there's creation, study, work done there because obviously there's profit incentives for you not to put a good out in the market that is likely to uh, get you awful publicity. And that's something the corporations are willing to do when states will look over it uh, the entire time. So while you don't have to claim that that's a perfect allocation of the people who really need things get the most, it certainly seems to be more effective than the way that states are willing to function at the time. Um, yes, and the two other points just to, that I, I mentioned in explaining that, but just to to point out there um, are that you the the incentive long term is for you to widen that market to get rid of a consumer surplus um, to develop goods that uh, that are sold at different prices so that you have different types of markets that you can enter into um, and finally corporate social responsibility I think is a helpful example of this and it is worth just bearing out um, the people I think take a very cynical uh, view of these market things and consumers and being very mean. Uh, but uh, I mean, a, a market seems to be only as cruel as the people buying from it. Uh, and an awful lot of people who are buying most goods these days are really very decent people. And so are the people running corporations. And obviously they have lots of other incentives and they have to many times uh, prioritize cost above other things. But I, I think it's least arguing in debates um, that often uh, companies are, whether they like it or not, forced to be very decent in many public ways, or at least um, are not restricted from being very decent when many of them would want to uh, as natural people. That incentives can align more than they would have to conflict. Now, I have two more particular things to mention in the workshop. The, the first is that I uh, think that that chat in particular in that last moment takes a bit of explaining in relation to um, patents. Um, as I think that fits in an awful lot of the way that I might expect a market to produce more goods in the first place uh, and also hope that they might be passed out amongst people. So this is actually, uh, I mean, as an aside, although this again will come up in far less debates, I think it's a really interesting question for people who are very hardcore right wing as to whether they accept patterns or not, uh, because it seems like a level of uh, market regulation that you might expect uh, a state to do. So I'm not sure how much libertarians um, can defend them. But when they do, it seems um, what they look for is to say that intellectual property is really a kind of property like anything else. So people are often very shocked when a pill that costs one cent to make is sold for $15, um, or whatever else. And, and that seems unjust in and of itself. But of course, it cost a number of billion to create that first pill at all. And I think that certainly you can claim in debates um, and you want to, whatever side of a patent debate you fall on, uh, I have certainly found in BP debates, the question is really how best you manipulate this tool to make people create the kind of goods that you want them to create. So whether you want to shorten that to push for more innovation, whether you, uh, uh, or more competition with goods at the moment, or whether you want to lengthen it to allow people to go into more expansive um, research and processing of goods that would still be profitable because they're still able to uh, recoup more money for longer is really the question in that. Um, and I think that this is very difficult in all the debates because there are unquestionably awful things that of course result out of the abuse of patents in some instances and people being charged far too much. Um, and yet when you look at uh, instances in history, I mean, I think uh, Ebola is quite a good example of something that had very little research done about it 
um, and very little process towards a cure uh, until that started affecting different markets and until that started uh, affecting a more Western market that it was more profitable um, for people to make that money in. Now, the reason I bring this up uh, uh, in this, which obviously not capitalism's shining moment there, is it? Um, but actually, I think it's important to highlight just how stark the contrast can be and how uncaring political forces can be until it makes any profit. And there's a real question to ask of if it hadn't uh, started becoming more profitable for companies to do so, uh, would there have been any research done philanthropically? Would people have just, uh, would states have just given their money to that? Because obviously it's it's in many instances, that kind of a donation um, intrastate is, is not something that's likely to win people many votes or to be a priority in their listings. So I think you want to take a very realistic stance when you're discussing patents in general and the creation of new goods, which is to say that often this is one of the few ways that we can manipulate markets into getting kind of outcome that we want. Um, and so it may well be worth it in some instances to allow a certain amount of profit, to allow things to be charged more expensively than we might ideally want them to be themselves if the long-term result of that is that you actually get goods that literally never would have existed uh, in the alternative. But the last thing that I would mention um, within this talk is that I think it is important sometimes for you to paint a credible alternative for how people are likely to react if you were to have a more right-wing um, stance. Now, I will say for this, this is very much so uh, for the land of debating, because I think there's very few instances in the world where you have uh, such extreme right-wing capitalism that these things uh, can be argued out. Uh, at least you can almost make it almost more of a thought experiment in an awful lot of debates. Um, but I think it's actually interesting to look at the way that often um, state responses or state approaches um, not only are less effective than you might want, but have a worse impact on the um, on, uh, that that actively undermine the positive things that would be happening alternatively. So the first of those is to ask whether um, things like welfare states uh, uh, and the support that people try to give uh, to those in terms of um, job seekers allowance is actually as effective as it would be uh, otherwise first because of the psychological effect that it places on people um, the uh, idea that individuals are described often in very dehumanizing manner by most of society um, and that it i think would feel more difficult to respond to that um, when the the narrative is very much so that they are dependent on something given to them by the state um, so I think that there's a real problem there and a concern in terms of the way that that system plays out and the, the benefits it can give to those. Um, but the other thing is that, that this kind of a, an approach squeezes other alternatives out of the market. Um, so to explain this before I, uh, I get to my, my big example, we might go back to our schooling question. So in a, a system where you have public schooling being uh, something that is funded by the state. It is very unlikely that you are able to uh, mount an absolutely private alternative in many instances. So except for the uber rich, people aren't able to foot the now very large bill of covering both their own uh, local school um, and indeed now this other public school. And I think that that's a real problem for those most vulnerable in society because their money obviously means most for them and losing even a little bit to go to this public school that they didn't really want and doesn't benefit them uh, it is more of an abuse. What it certainly means is that they don't have money to now spend on their private one. I think you can extrapolate that analysis also into an awful lot of charitable uh, ventures or ways to spend your money. So if you wouldn't be able to spend double in terms of funding your own school uh, and the state school, I think you also are less likely to give as much to charity and to benefit people through that. And this leads us, I suppose, possibly to a warped sense of community where states take so much money from people and, and uh, foot so much of the kind of social responsibility bill that we build communities that uh, very seldom ask individuals to make those donations and people then are, uh, you know, cultured and influenced into a society um, that makes them less likely to want to do that. Um, I think that the big example that's quite interesting about this is to look at fraternal societies and mutual aid societies that existed in the United Kingdom and in America uh, just around the 1900s. Um, so in America in the 1890s, um, 
you had 112,000 individuals uh, housed in by private aid institutions. That was people paying into, uh, essentially when it's a mutual aid side, the idea is that I suppose like a collective insurance pool. So everyone pays an X amount of money and it goes to when somebody is made homeless, when somebody uh, be becomes a widow and needs financial support um, or whatever other instances uh, existed, particularly in that time frame in the social institutions uh, that of course existed that meant uh, people would become very vulnerable um, in situations like if if the uh, a male member of the family died, um, so you had one hundred twelve thousand in private institutions, with only seventy three thousand publicly housed. Now, I, of course, I think would be it'd be neglect not to point out that in the eighteen nineties, not a hell of a lot of people were publicly housed by the United States government. It wasn't really the vibe. But the important thing that I do think comes out of this example is to highlight the way that societies can actually take steps beyond what a government. Uh, lays down for them what a government thinks is socially acceptable. So more than what people would vote for at the time, they were willing to hand out of their own pocket and to look after individuals. I mean, in that in 1910, you had a third of all adult um, males in America belonged to a lot of fraternal organizations. So you had huge numbers willing to get engaged in, I suppose, these kind of collective community insurance programs. And they were able to function for people in quite an effective way. So I suppose the importance that you take out of that in an awful lot of debates uh, is simply highlighting that alternatives are available, that people are willing to act in a decent and a good manner, um, and really a faith in humanity far more through personal lives than through the ballot box. Um, if you need to defend that in debates, I, I think there's good reason to point out that in your everyday life, when you are asked directly about charities, when you experience suffering around you in communities, you are far more likely to respond in private measures than when something is laid down to you by a government. So on either side, lots of people are removed from suffering uh, and are, are not ideal often at responding to it. But certainly when it's at least an appeal from a person asking you for help or a charity on that person's behalf asking you for specific help, people are a lot more inclined um, intuitively to help that out than they are when they're um, when another politician comes to them with another wacky idea to spend their money in a way that doesn't seem very appealing to them. So that's one way that can work. And I think the the general uh, theme that an awful lot of people who are very far on the right might support is a voluntary tax system. And that certainly deals with an awful lot of the ideas that we had about um, tax and government spending being very untransparent and people not being able to um, fund that uh, and have the control over that that they would want. So the idea is, of course, that you um, that you get to choose whether you want to fund X, Y or Z tax projects. And if you have a government that's doing awful things, like if you're, a, um, f for example, going back to those examples, uh, trying to base them in America, of looking at how a person of color might feel in a district with huge police brutality, uh, or a queer person might feel in a community um, that is funding electroshock therapy, then you are able to pull your money out of that and have far more direct consent, at least, than simply saying that because you're part of a community and you benefit in some way, uh, that you also owe whatever money is, uh, is demanded by the state. So I think we have more or less hit the end. Um, sorry, I'm just, I'm now trying to technology. I don't believe that there are any questions being asked. Um, let me just double check that they're not in here. Uh, there it is. Nope, we're all good. Nobody wants to chit chat. Uh, just now. So I won't take any more of your time. Um, in general, just to recap, so what we want to do is that there are uh, four groundings we've discussed. The first is that accountability um, is uh, to a large extent ineffective in necessarily in any kind of, um, of more government-led or uh, socialist approaches to allocating wealth. The second is that it seems to jar um, with the idea of restricting a state's power, with giving people control over the economic uh, influences in their lives and putting a check on government power. The third is that it seems to demand of, um, the product of their labor in a way that we, we would usually find a little bit, uh, little bit unacceptable. And the third is that um, humans, ha it, it seems to jar with the human need to uh, in some way have influence on the world around you and control it. So then the other thing we went through is five hopefully helpful reasons that markets tend to be more effective um, and then we looked at ways in which they are likely to help uh, specifically more vulnerable people in communities more so than others. I hope it was a helpful chat um, and all the best. See you now.